The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Zurich Australia Limited, ABN 92000 010 195 AFSL 232 510 and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Welcome to the Engine Room Unpacked. I'm Sue Viscovich from Alexa Consulting and I'm thrilled that I get to join your host, Andrew Rocks, to unpack the last five episodes and explore some of the nuggets of absolute gold, brilliant ideas and strategies that you too can deploy to enjoy greater success from your engine room. Well, let's go. Zurich is proud to be supporting this episode. The Zurich and OnePath Advisor portal is more efficient than ever before, giving you access to two leading brands with three highly sought after products, underpinned by two powerful underwriting engines, all with one simple sign on, making it easier for you to do business and perform at your best. Welcome to another edition of the Engine Room Unpacked. I really, really like these unpacked ones because it's a bit like, you know, when you go to a, a conference and, and you get all this information and and you just you just think you're going to come and, and, and you write all these notes down and you may even take photos on your phone and um, I only really see those again when I'm on the plane and I haven't got Wi-Fi. Um, and then you go, well, I haven't actually done that takeout. And what unpacked does is it just gives a bit of a, a loop back based on the last couple of really high quality practices. And when we're joined by, you know, exceptional people to run through that. So today's unpacked, we're going to run through three really cool firms. The first one is the Blueprint Wealth Team um, in Western Australia. Great business. And I had the pleasure of talking to Bree Stevens, who's the general manager there. The next practice is Family Wealth Advisory in Sydney. Um, and I had the, the pleasure of talking with Michael Baver, but more importantly, Belinda Dalton, who's the practice manager in that business. And then finally, Sherlock Wealth in North Sydney, um, where yet again, I spoke with Andrew Sherlock, but also, most importantly, the CEO, Jackie Sherlock. So there's a bit of a theme in the way in which I've introduced these. Um, so without any further ado, I'd like to welcome my partner in crime today in unpacking, Sue Miskovich. How are you, Sue? Hey, hello, Roxy. I am great. So lovely to be with you. I love these sessions. Awesome. And um, we were chatting, you know, off air before, um, and we made this conscious decision to only unpack three firms today. The reason is, is that they're all quite big. And in fact, if you have a look at it, if you have a look at the theme of the industry, a lot of a lot of practices are figuring out, you know, how do you go from a jo- a, a job to a practice. And the, all these practices are, are at practice level. And then the real art is how do you go from a practice to an enterprise? And, um, um, the, I think all three of these are, uh, are at, at that particular stage. And I think that, um, potentially Blueprint may have one or two years jump on the other two as far as moving into that enterprise. What's your thoughts, Sue? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right, Roxy. Uh, you know, there's the one risk that we did have in picking these three firms was that there might be a lot of listeners thinking, oh, I'm so far away from that, that I, I, I can't relate. But I think it's really important to listen to what's happening in firms like this because it it's not to say bigger is always better, uh, but I think a lot of the challenges that firms are facing do get solved as they get to a almost a critical mass size and they can start implementing some of these strategies and roles within the business. So, yeah, I, I think all of these three firms have done amazing things. They're, they're already achieving great stuff. They're all talking about what's next for them and what else they want to continue to to achieve. And the strategies and the, uh, the concepts that they're implementing so well, I think, are applicable at many levels of business. So, yeah, they're exciting. And as my guest for all the unpacking, what are the what are the themes or, or or the framework that you'd like to run through to touch on with these three practices? Thanks, Roxy. Yeah, it's uh, I love doing this, right? Because it, it does allow us to 
galvanize our, our discussion points because we could riff on this stuff all day. Uh, so when I was looking at these three guys, the, the first one I want to pull out is we're going to be talking about the impact of separating out the role of an operational manager. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, and then we're actually drawing on one of the quotes from Brie that we love so much in the session, and that's where we're going to talk about the numbers don't lie, uh, having a chat and drawing out the good business disciplines that all of these firms are, are executing. And then we're actually going to wrap with one of the key things that drew all of them together was quite consistent and that they're all building a global team. So achieving the outcomes that they want to while minimizing their cost, maximizing the quality of talent that they've got, uh, by building this global team, because there's a lot to be learned from that too. And, uh, you know, the very first um, comment there about uh, separating the role of, of, of operations or practice manager from from typical CEO is, uh, and it was a real pleasure to interview these three back to back and have have those. And we we've had a, we had a couple of um, of our practice managers. It was their first time on a podcast, and they knew who they are, but they they definitely didn't sound oh, you like wouldn't it. Have known no, it. not at all. Well, no. they know their stuff, right? And and I think yeah. that that. Bringing that that person forward is is just helping the industry. Recently, I was um, having a think about you know the difference between a CEO um, hiring or, or appointing someone to run a practice, and there's two outcomes. There's a CEO who fully supports their people and gives them the tools and whatnot, and then there's a CEO yeah. who says, "I'm getting a practice manager." They hire the practice manager. They tell them exactly what to do. They micromanage them. Okay, and they blame them for anything that went wrong. So effectively, what they've hired, what they've done is they've hired an executive assistant on double the wage. And I know that a lot of people yeah. feel like that. Yes, and, and I think that's a little mix of maybe they can't get their fingers out of the pie. Like they've been doing it for so long, it's just a habit. So that there requires some conscious decision making about what their new role looks like now that they've got this this operational leader, um, as well as then. Like you say, giving them the tools to be able to do their job really well. In most cases, they hire with the right intention, so they get really good quality people. Uh, and then, yeah, the ability to enable them to do their job and also provide the tools to do it. So as they're implementing new ideas or new strategies in the business, sometimes challenges come up that, you know, even an experienced person hasn't done before. But that doesn't mean that the CEO necessarily needs to to step across the line and and save them. You know, usually they've hired really well. Let them figure it out. Yeah, I think you're right. And and one of the the things about running a, a practice in financial planning is it's although we're here today and we we're quite familiar with lots of them. It's quite a small industry. In fact, it's tiny, right? Um, sure. So you just don't get that opportunity to have sort of a, a peer based comparison. But in saying that, um, I recently you sent me through your um, research paper that you yeah. had uh, you had done on practice management. And before we get into it, maybe um, how has how has that um, influenced the way in which you look at practice management now? Oh, that's a great question, Roxy. Um, so th this is uh, our practice management research that spans across. Well, at the moment, there's two outputs from it. One is the operations uh, report which is really looking into the back office and, and how firms are running their operations. Um, and we knew a lot of information anecdotally. You know, we've been doing this, working with firms for 17 years. We've got a bunch of coaches. We share knowledge. So some of the things that came out were confirming what we already knew, but now actually like giving us some very rock hard data. Oh, I'm going to talk about some of them now. One is that the, this element of separating out the operational manager, that is one of the ingredients to the secret sauce that we have discovered in how to run an awesome back office, right? Um, I'm going to look at, talk about a few different things scattered throughout too, but that's, that came from a lot of the interviews that we were doing. Um, you know, Lana Clark is my colleague who pulled this report together. Um, and it was very, very evident when a firm gets to the size at which they can put somebody in charge of operations. Now, when I say somebody, sometimes it actually is the lead advisor or the advisor owner of the business because they love doing that. They've decided that's what they really want to do instead of working with clients. But the trick is it makes a difference when they then offload some of their clients onto the other advisors. So it's, it's not so much about the actual role itself, but it's about knowing that you've got somebody completely focused on management of your operations. And they could be called a practice manager or an operations manager or general manager. Sometimes it's the CEO themselves or the managing director. 
but somebody who has their eyes over how the back office is running and, and the overall business. And then suddenly they fly. Well, maybe not suddenly, but they start flying faster. Well, let's take that quite passionate response and let's let's uh, put the, the lens or the microscope on, on the three practices. So what's your thoughts around um, each one of the practices and, and have they got that particular element um, right, the secret source? Yeah, I think so. I, and, you know, if, if we look at, say, Blueprint as first example, my, my beautiful people over here in Western Australia, how could I not love them? Um, Brie is an absolute You, you know you're part of I Australia, that- you're not a separate country. We've, had, we've established this. Yeah, you are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that. I can't help myself. There's something about the sunshine over here. Um, you know, I mean, look, it came through when you were talking to Brie. You know, she's an absolute gun. She's worked in that business for, you know, I think 20 years or something. And, and she started out in admin and has come all the way through. Um, and just hearing her speak about the firm, uh, is important. In fact, you know what? I think. She was she, – we do have a really good quote from Bree. Why don't we play that now, actually, because we couldn't say it any better. I think one of the great things about working with David was him recognising that, uh, you know, once the business gets to a certain size, there's a limit to what uh, an advisor can do as a business owner. So understanding that you need someone to work on the business, not in the business, and and that created a lot of opportunities for me to to go through – Um, and help shape how the business grew over time. See what I mean? She's so great. Uh, And and it's interesting because then if we look at Sherlock, that was quite a different story, right? So Brie had come through the business. She knew it intimately. She took on these management roles over time. Jackie was a very successful person in other um, industries, in other professions, um, and it was actually a really interesting conversation that she had with her husband. And it was almost that the light bulb moment came from a, somebody completely external to the business that wasn't connected to it to let him know, hey, maybe there's a better way to do this. Why don't we listen to Jackie? Well, I think how I came to work for the business is a slightly different story. Uh, my background's in public relations and marketing working in-house agency, companies like McDonald's, Volvo, SAP, Oracle, Intel back in the day. And then I'd taken some time out of the workforce to have our three beautiful daughters. And it was probably, uh, what year was it? About 2012. Um, Andrew kept trying to put me on a budget. And I said to him one day, you know what? I'm sick of you trying to put me on a budget, Andrew. Why don't you just earn more? <laughs> and in fact, why aren't you? And he reeled off a long list of reasons why he wasn't. And I said to him, oh my goodness, babe, do you want me to come in and help you? And he said, yeah, I would actually. So um, I started out, it, the brief was to come in and work one day a week and just help him out with a few probably marketing things actually. Uh, but it very quickly morphed into something else. And it was probably largely because at the time we had just engaged with Peloton and uh, they came in and did a, a big review of the business. And, and they would have done pricing and value and all stuff of like that. All of that. And yeah. um, we ended up hiring them and they helped us through a critical phase of transformation of the business. Yep. And as part of that review, they realised or we all realised that Andrew was probably spending 40 to 50% of his time actually running the business rather than working on the clients and that's what he loves the best. So I very quickly was asked to come in as general manager and basically take off the 40% of his time that he was doing on the business and take that over. So one of my takeouts from from that particular um excerpt is is just the introduction of 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 an external coach. I think uh uh they uh the, the Jackie um and Andrew used Peloton. They came in, they did that, you know, one of the common themes is these these people, although um, they are a quite a substantial practice, all three of them, they're still obtaining external external coaching, which I know is quite self serving for you, for yourself, Sue. But but you know, like I think <laughs> I think uh, you know, lead advisors make great technical financial planners, and and indeed I, I was that, and probably you know I always think back what what courses should I have done in the twenty five years that I was in financial planning? Probably more business management courses. 
rather than yeah, rather than yet yeah. another sort of Centrelink course. So, um, what's your thoughts? Well, I look, of course, I couldn't agree more about having the external input. Um, I mean, I think it's I think it's not just about learning how to run a business better. It is also sometimes when you're in the business, you can't necessarily see it um, objectively. So it's really powerful to have somebody else come and, and give you that oversight. But I think also you do run the risk when you are a successful business is that you almost become a victim of your own success, right? Because you get stuck in your business all the time. And quite often, the techniques and the skills and the habits that got you to this point are different to the skills and techniques and habits that are going to get you to where you want to go. So, it, it just makes sense that you can't necessarily do that of your own volition if you don't have access to really great minds and, and other ideas and concepts. But you know what? The actual better takeaway I like out of that whole thing with Jackie was the budget. Oh, hilarious. Did you get yes. that? <laughs> finally, <laughs> finally someone that, telling right? the truth. <laughs> <laughs> the, yeah, the whole thing of oh, you know, we need to tighten our belts because times are tight, uh, you know difficult and and you're spending too much. Well, hang on. The actual reality is, and and being in business, you have the ability to do this. The reality is, you can actually make more money if you do things a little bit different. So how about yeah, that? It's hilarious. I mean, that contrarian <laughs> thinking, it's positive, isn't it? Um, I, I was also yeah, uh, yeah. I was thinking to. You know that was the genesis of the reason for 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 Sherlock. But but you know when I was chatting to to Michael and Belinda um, from Family Wealth Advisory, yeah. Michael had gone through a pretty tough time in his life, and uh, you know he kind of rebooted and started again. He was very generous and and very genuine with with he, with his story, right. and kind of um uh you know is a is a very good practitioner, has some pretty good um uh, ideas on on what he wants and how he wants it, but. He just realized that that you blink and all of a sudden you become a you've got this business for a lot of people, and um, I think that's when when I can't uh, when Belinda came into the business was at that stage. So I think his business was bending but not breaking, and I think he might have just been able to yes. put that person or that right person in the right seat at the right time. So let's have a listen to to uh, you know what Michael had said as how as far as what was the catalyst for him to get a practice manager into his business. Really, I I came across Belinda when I got to a point where the turnover of staff was just getting way too high. So, something wasn't right. And I think I came to the realization that we really needed better processes in the back office. And that that was really the kind of the key moment for me. Uh, And and it was also right at that juncture where I was going, am I a sole practitioner just with some great staff or am I going to become a business? So, I did sit down with my wife and I said, look, I know what's involved to move from a sole practitioner to a business. But I'm not great at – I'm not as good as what Belinda is at, at bringing people along for the journey. I'll Were keep, you aware of that at the time? No, I don't think I was. I was just like, this is a great vision. This is – you know, you're really good at your job. I'm good at my job. Off we go. Yeah. But in terms of looking back and sort of saying and nurturing them and saying bring them along for the journey, that was really probably – after I'd lost probably two, three, four really good people, I thought – this has got to change. And if we want to run a proper business and really get to, because I've always had a vision, I want to, I want to, I want to look after a thousand families, right? The only way I'm going to get there is to find someone like Bell who can come on board and really set the foundations for we can actually run a proper business. Isn't that fascinating? It's something that we see really often is that, you know, being a leader is different to being a manager. Uh, and, and it was great. I love how you, you asked my, Michael, was, you know, did he know that at the time? And, and he was honest. He's like, no, I, I didn't, you know, I couldn't see it when I was doing it. But after making that realization and then bring, bringing Belinda in and having someone that's so good at doing it, that was when he could really see the impact of it. And, you know, it's fascinating when you look at, you know, if you compare Andrew and, and Michael in that regard, you know, Michael's the leader. Andrew is absolutely leading his business, but they also recognize that that they love seeing the clients and they're good at seeing the clients. So when we see this across all businesses, there's a point of at in time at which that owner leader or owner advisor realizes that it's time to have somebody really focusing on that management aspect of the business, and then it's the time to really have some introspective thinking around what am I best at doing? What's my personal skill set? 
what do I love doing and what's going to serve the business best? So, you know, in Andrew's case, it was get him in front of clients. That's his highest and best use. So why keep him, you know, caught up in doing the the management side? Um, similar thing with Michael, let Belinda come in and take all of that off his hands. I mean, this, Roxy, this, this is such a critically important part of a business that there's actually a real danger zone, I think, for firms that are not yet at this point. So, you know, when you're a small business, the the owner's kind of juggling all the hats and doing everything and, and as quickly as possible, I'm saying get out of that space, get yourself to the point of having a couple of advisors on the team so you're losing that key or reducing that key person risk. But then there's a period of time where you're not turning over sufficient revenue to warrant a full-time practice manager. Like that's a big leap, right, for a firm to take on a non-revenue generating salary at that level. But what I would say is there are ways to do it. And if you're intentional about it, you can get that person elevating the firm as quickly as you can. Because the reality is, sure, they might not be re- revenue generating, but if you get somebody great, then they will empower the revenue generators to make a butt ton more money and bring more revenue in and business and it all flows and you've got greater capacity. Yeah, well, they're efficiency generating and they're, they're lowering cost of goods and, and all these things that actually uh, oh, generate a bit. Oh, terms are much. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> Do you like that? We're talking in important terms. I'm talking butt ton of money. <laughs> I'm not sure. Is that, exactly. I'm not, is that like a furlong? I'm not sure what, what year is this. Are we going back to the, the ye old English imperial or is this just a, a, a suism? Indeed we are, to be sure. Yeah. Uh, ye only. It's a suism. I'm sorry, sorry. about that. Uh, but um, the key to it really is you could do something like you like happened with Bree where she was already working in the firm, she was great at administration, and then they were adding more and more management roles to her um, job and then allowing whoever was doing it before to to go on to other work. You could bring in a part time um, practice manager. It could be that if the owner then decides they still want to do that, they just transition some of their clients to the other revenue generators to free up time. There's a whole bunch of different ways to do it. But I guess the moral of the story here is get to the point as quickly as you can to be able to put somebody on with that specific role of managing the business. I think that's right, but that's just the start, right? So, you know, if we look at, at, at the Blueprint team, um, Brie, Brie speaks, uh, first of all, she's a shareholder. She, she's Brie, been a shareholder right. for a while. Um, her entire That's language, important. her entire language is we do this, our, um, there's no, when you talk to her, there's no thought that she's, that, that people in management and operations are any different to their advisors. I mean, a big shout out to, to her lead advisors and shareholders, you know, David, Brad, Daniel, and, and the whole team there. They obviously stand behind, you know, how she runs the business. I'm sure that they give their input, um, but ultimately they don't. They once the decision is made, they have the confidence um, for allowing um, Breed to do that. But I suppose the other thing is, is that um, there's some accountability. So when you're an advisor, um, uh, you know, an AR, or um, the accountability is what's the revenue you write. And I think some people get concerned. It's very hard to hold your your back office to account, which is, you know leads into how much do I pay them, how much value do they deliver, should they become a shareholders. But the next theme of yours, which is the numbers don't lie, good business disciplines, just basically throws all of that rubbish out and just goes, the central part of this is numbers don't lie. What's your thoughts? Yes. Yeah. I love that line from Brie. It's so true. And and this comes down to the the discipline of running it like a business. So being very clear on what the business is trying to achieve, the growth that you're working towards. Uh, and look, that when I say growth, it may not necessarily be even top or bottom line growth. It could even be the growth of the people in the business. So the next year, we're just going to upskill people or, you know, we're going to grow the capacity of the team that we've got, you know, whatever it's related to every firm in their planning has got an element of growth. And and it's important to be able to plan that out and then look at what how are we going to know how we're progressing? What are the numbers we, you know, what are the critical numbers that we want to have our our eyes on on a regular basis to know whether we're getting there or not and to recognize, you know, maybe some trends, maybe where we're going off track. Uh, but make sure that somebody is managing that and everybody in the business understands what those things mean so they know their role in in the, the game. And look, I vividly remember, even though uh, it was um, la- end of last year, um, when Bree did uh, make that comment, numbers don't lie. But I think, I think um, 
uh, as much as you think that might be a little bit of a, uh, a sort of a, a buzz one, um, she then followed it up with, I think, and you can't hide or something like that. So it was like, <laughs> it's a carrot and a stick yeah. there. But I, I believe, yeah. um, Kieran Siago, I reckon we've got, uh, we can dig up a breeze, uh, numbers day lie quote, um, and also the context yeah. over to you, Kieran and Bree. Let's have a listen. Yeah, I, look, I think through the particular areas that we measure in the balance scorecard, it helps us understand, you know, if we start to see a trend of something going wrong, we can then work with that particular team to understand what's going wrong or, or what the issues are and then adapt. Um, so a good example of that was uh, we have all our clients on 12-month annual advice agreements um, and what we were finding was we weren't getting as many of them in before that 12-month agreement expired, um, which we picked up through doing this reporting. So we were a- able to change that that process, which was only a you know a little tweak to what we needed the system to do, but it improved that uh, that renewal rate from was about 70% to 95%. So um, oh, you know, wow. the, the numbers don't lie; you can't you can't hide. So yeah, little things like that you can you can pick up through doing that regular reporting and oversight in the business. So as you can see, it's not just about revenue numbers. Um, I mean, they're important, uh, especially when you're talking about advisors. You know, they need to know how many clients should they be managing, uh, but also what's required in the back office to be able to efficiently and effectively deliver those services. So when we talk critical numbers, Roxy, we we generally have a, a whole range of them that we know impact a firm and we encourage our clients to pick the ones that are most relevant to them to suit the stage at which they are at in their business plan. Um, if you're trying to track too many things, sometimes it just gets meaningless and 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 people don't really uh, grasp it. So at least having three to five metrics that you know everybody understands what they're looking at and what this should be telling them. So obviously, you know, for growth for the advisors, we we love having conversations across the profession, right? around revenue per advisor because there's a lot of talk about clients per advisor, but that's a little bit difficult to make to compare apples to apples, right? Because, you know, to, to some, uh, their average client might be 3000 a year and they're very, very straightforward to the next. There's a lot of complexity and a lot of time spent on them and they're spending 20 grand a year. Um, but revenue per advisor then yes, allows that's one. Firms- Revenue per advisor is one. What else you got? Revenue per advisor, yep. Uh, and then think about the activity that's required. So you've got activity in the front end. So the advisor is speaking with clients, typically doing their client reviews and new client meetings. But then, of course, that also has a whole bunch of work that flows through to the back office that needs to get turned around in an appropriate amount of time. Otherwise, the advisor is not going to be able to serve the client. Where, well, let me rephrase that. The firm is not going to be able to service the client really well. So some of your metrics for the back office might be, you know, the number of advice documents that are, are turned around within a week or within a month, um, the amount of time in which uh, those documents get in and out the door. And the t- when I say documents, it, again, depends on what that team's working with. If they've got a full client load and it's mostly uh, review kind of work with existing clients, that might be different to the numbers that you track if it's a new business team and there's a whole host of, uh, of new work to be done. And what's the third one? This is a really tricky one to pick because it depends on the size and the and the, the where the firm is at well, in their well, growth. I, 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 say it in, in in relation to the lens of the three ones we're talking about. What would you what would you say? Well, you, you'd have to be looking at EBIT, right? The top line numbers don't mean a lot um, if you're not considering the cost and the capacity and the bottom line. Well, I've got two takeouts from that. Is one is if you're thinking of having a, an employee share scheme to bring your junior advisors, the next generation through, and there's a big chance they're going to have to get lending to buy into the business. Uh-huh. If you're not hyper-focused on EBIT and having a dividend policy, they're not going to be able to service those debts. Okay. Oh, so so it's going to be, it'll be the opposite impact. So that's the first one. The second thing, oh, going back to your second point um, around operational, capacity management is what I see is a real killer. And it goes two ways. People probably think capacity management, I have um, a bunch of people not doing enough, mm. okay? And that is a that, that will drive your EBIT down. But I can tell yeah. you another one that drives it down just as fast is when you've got two little people overworked and they leave, okay? So so the, 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 the lever is, and the other one is sometimes because we, 
we if people if we have this business where we keep throwing people rather than systems and process and and culture at it, you keep giving the jobs to the person who's the most competent and capable, right? Until you break, they them. get overworked. And guess yeah. what? One day they go, I can just take this awesome package to the next person, and you lose your best and you keep your worst, right? So yeah. capacity management. So I think the pract- all three of these practices have pretty good handle on capacity management. They have great cadences. Um, as far as the rhythm of how they do things, ranging from daily huddles to, you know, what's important on a daily basis. So getting tight with those numbers and getting tight with that um, uh, that, that kind of discipline um, has made a big difference. Um, yeah. Also, yeah. they've got three different styles of businesses. They've got their pricing sorted, I would say, most all of them. Um, mm-hmm. So Sounds now cool. capacity management's a, a, an absolute critical driver of their bottom line. Yes. And you know uh, who articulated that really well uh, was Michael Bova. Uh, in fact, you know, let's throw to that quote that we, we pulled which, out. Which let's one was, what, that. Was, what was the, was the theme This there. is where he's talking about um, the activity of the advisors. Oh, uh, getting them so to the just of- see clients. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, no right? brainer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah but, okay, yeah, well, let's throw yeah, that let's one. Let's hear Michael. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I think they say the research that good good practices, are, you know, between sort of eight, six to eight, those are running at 10. The more meetings, uh, what I understand is the more you get in front of clients, the better you're going to do. So, the more at, the more um, advisors are just staying in front of their clients, the, the better off the practice is going to be and the happier everyone is. So, um, because we're in a building out phase where both of our advisors still have capacity, yep. I'm not expecting them to be hitting that. But the but for me it's just about seeing activity and um and so I've got kind of my my dashboard that comes through on a weekly basis and that that sort of gives me a pretty good indication as to how the practice is going. As a former advisor, the happy place for ARs is in front of clients. You mm-hmm. know, sometimes when I think Michael was saying there are uh, six to eight, um um you know meetings and 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 you know getting getting some just getting in front of people is not a chore. It's actually the happiest time of the day for most advisors but yeah. how how do practices go from wanting that to actually be able to do it to oh well, you've got to build again it's this concept of business disciplines isn't it right you've got to build the team and build the processes and build the technology around the advisor to be able to put them in that position and you know it is something that we see a lot of um you know looking at one of those metrics i've had firms that say to me sue I have, our advisors struggle to do more than four or five, you know, client meetings a week. And therein lies the problem, right? Um, if they don't have the right, uh, infrastructure around the advisor, I mean, look, let's face it. One of the, the tightest or, or most difficult commodities to get in the profession today is qualified great advisors. Okay. We know that we've lost thousands of them. We know that there's not enough to service the, the clients that we need. Um, what is it, 15,500? And we're not replacing them fast enough because it's taken so long to get through PY and so forth. Oh, and and, so and the, the other thing line, is they're that in demand that they're yeah. going to find the best place to work that works for them. Yes. It's sort of yes. it's really an interesting time in that particular facet of our talent matrix. Mm, it is. And I think – but what I do see to that point though, Roxy, is where you have got – a firm with great culture, the advisors really are, are involved in the business and they're, they're empowered, they don't have to do the tasks that are not their highest and best work, they stick around no matter what somebody else throws at them, particularly to your point earlier that if you can build uh, equity models where they can actually be part of the ownership structure of the business. But I think the key to this is is this team-serviced approach. So from the client perspective, if you've got advisors, and ideally you want them, like look at those numbers, get them seeing 10, 12 meetings a week. Do not be asking them to do anything that is not requiring a license. So you want advisors doing the work that only advisors can do. Typically that is doing the majority of the talking to clients, understanding them, delving into their needs, talking about the strategies with the clients, get great power planners that sit behind them that can take their technical knowledge and build the strategies, do the optimization, do all of that technical work, get your great admin people around to take every piece of administrative work away from the advisor. Anything that they don't need to be doing, 
they shouldn't be doing. And it also means for the client that when they need something, that advises in lots of meetings, but they're really comfortable talking to uh, a, a Carol or a John or somebody else in the firm who gets them. And then you're not creating that impact of that key person receiver. Oh, look, and I'm, I'm going to um, take you through a little anecdote. Uh, so Kieran, the sound guy and myself, we went to uh, North Sydney um, and uh, we set up for our podcast with uh, Sherlock Welf and um, their whole team looked after us. And uh, so we're, we're there, um, we've got the, the mics ready and, uh, um, and then um, all of a sudden all of their team get up, they all walk to the middle of their room the the whiteboard comes out. Yeah. All of their you know global team dial in, and they go, "Oh, we can't do our podcast until we finish our compulsory daily huddle." That basically runs like an absolute well oiled machine. I, I'd love to hear, I, I, Kieran, if you can go searching for that in the in, in the magical period of time <laughs> that I, I, I say throw to that particular quote, <laughs> then it'd be great to hear how Sherlock's have have kind of moved into that real team philosophy because if for those of you who listen to the Sherlock one, the Sherlock brand's been around for fifty years. But but Andrew and, right. and Jackie you know bought their the business from from their from their father um and and of from Andrew's father and and are rebooting it and looking to grow it into more of a an an enterprise. So um I might just uh uh and by the way, um I was in their daily huddle and had to tell me my had to, I was asked my key takeouts for the day as well. So I love it. <laughs> it was cute. It was good. Oh, it was really good. It was really good. So um, um, let's throw to um, Andrew's quote, please, Kieran. I mean, she's, if I could step in here, she's a very important part of the team, obviously. She knows the clients pretty well as well as I do. All the clients love her and the service that they get from her. And she's just really enjoyed her journey as well. And I think part of the reason that she's had the tenure she's had and she's had the loyalty that she's had with our firm is she hasn't obviously just sat there doing the same thing year in year out for 20 years she came on board she was our receptionist very very junior and she's been very keen to learn and progress over time she's done the dfp she's become educated in the financial advice process and so the value that she can add to our clients as the head of client service has you know improved over time dramatically as well and one thing we always say to our team, you know, we've been here a long time because clearly we're, we're trusted and respected, but we're going to be here for a long time because we're really great at adapting and pivoting. And I think Crystal has been a really good example of being able to pivot and adapt as the industry has changed, as we've changed as, as a business. And uh, so credit to her. But yes, yeah, somebody said to me, look, she practically is a Sherlock, which is probably <laughs> true. <laughs> And don't you love that, Roxy? You know, Jackie's talking about, or well, both of them were talking about this fantastic team member, Crystal. So when I was talking about, you know, your advisors are, a, a, you know, a, a critical resource and we want to build the team around them, I'm not just talking about elevating them as the only heroes in this game. Because again, that's not true in a business sense, in reality, but it's also uh, exacerbating that key person risk. There are lots of fabulous people in advisory businesses that contribute to delivering outstanding service to the clients. So my, my point there is make sure that your structure and your, your operating rhythm has the best people playing the best roles in the business. It actually reduces your risk of, of being, um, you know, at risk to having limited numbers of advisors, right? Um, the other thing about that. You know, we're talking about the this separating role of management. All of these firms have got to the point where you there is a there's a CEO level and multiple different operational managers. You know, like if if you look at Jackie, she's the general manager now, and she's got other people that are taking things uh, on board for them. I think the same for Belinda. Certainly, very much the same for Bree as well. But it's picking the right uh, people for different roles. To, to be clear. Their CEOs that just that the C yeah. either in name or or their current CEO doesn't know that yet. Yeah. <laughs> Shout out to everyone. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> eight mail to the usual address. Yeah, of course. Uh, it's your address, by the way. Um, but it's also um, it's also then knowing who's responsible for what and having role clarity again. This business discipline, having role clarity about whose job is it to do the various aspects that need to get done, and relying on everybody to be part of this whole Kaizen approach. You know, let's make sure we keep Swim doing lanes. things better. 
Yes, yes, allow people to stay within their swim lanes, not cross over them, get the best people doing the highest and best work. But that is also a, a bit around, you know, you talk about shareholders and, and sharing equity with advisors. We're really keen and, and we see great success with, with firms doing this with all of their key people. You know, yes, the advisors oh, are the revenue generators, um, but uh, but having that stretch across the the awesome people in the business, um, and then that's the business discipline that we're talking about too. It's not just about financials and profit; it's also how the business is delivering to its people, um, because we are a people business, right? You know, most every benchmarking stat you see, you know, the cost of staff is sort of fifty percent. Yeah. In really great ones, we're talking 45% of the revenue. So they'd be by far your greatest cost. So looking after them is really important. And I love what Sherlock's do in this regard. Do we want to play that one? Kieran, do we have a swim lane orientated quote somewhere in the <laughs> archives for Sherlock's? I'm sure we do. Um, over to, uh, I believe, um, Jackie and Andrew. Yeah. Well, we're very outcomes driven. And um, we have – everybody knows the targets. We've always got an overall team business target that we're all chasing so that way we're not competing with each other. And then within that, we, we try and stay in our swim lanes and the way we measure it is you've seen our whiteboards, <laughs> still love Excel, and are reporting in each week to the team meetings on how you're going with your goals and in your lanes. And yeah. what would be your 10-year North Star? Uh, well, we have two. <laughs> I pre-read fi- everyone. I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you sound smarter than I am. One's a financial BHAG uh, and then our we have also have a feel-good BHAG. Uh, the feel-good BHAG is to give and to receive a 1,000 messages of appreciation. Which um, is also up on your wall. It's all yes, up on yes. our wall. We, we very much cultivate a culture of gratitude. And in fact, we start our team meetings each week with sending a message of gratitude to somebody. And then if you want that counted in the BHAG, that's up to you. Or if that happens to be a personal message, you don't have to count it. But we get a real kick out of receiving messages, whether it's via text on the website, email, and, um, you know, growing, growing that number. But I, I think our, our promise to our clients and to anybody that we work with actually, we promise that your life will be better through your association with us. So isn't that great? I mean, measuring your financials and your business success and your bottom line is so important, but, but the bottom line is you only get that way when you're delivering outstanding service to clients. And so having a real measure in the business to s- allow clients to see the impact or allow team members to see the impact they're having on the business, I just love that. And you know what? It means having that discipline in the business. Most people see the word discipline as a negative thing, but when you have got that discipline and it makes the business effective and work really well, it means you can also have more fun with it. Um, you know what? I, let's just sorry, throw straight back to Sherlock because I love this quote too. Uh, we, we work in 90-day increments, so we'll have three projects that we're focusing on. We'll have a meeting to vote on whether we achieved the green in each of the so, projects. So like a Russian voting style? Uh, no, it's like you've got, did you achieve the outcome stated? And we're all very harsh. So if we get a triple, triple green in all of our projects, we will have already decided what the event will be. So uh, the team love doing fun things together. We've done things like uh, sip and paint. We've done cocktail making. The one for this quarter, if we get double greens and everything, we are going to the Sydney fish markets and we're going to do a cooking course with wine and uh, and this one, everybody's going to bring their special person, whether that's a partner or a special person in their life. So we're all looking forward to that one. I love the enthusiasm of people in the industry and um, you can really hear the genuine joy um, in that. Now, people are sitting back going, well, how do you how do you do that at scale? Because no doubt what we've just heard is a, a really well-intended in, in, practice. They got really tight. They are scaling up. But when I think about my conversation with the Blueprint and, and Bree, what struck me was just part of that business discipline is having a well-structured process. So, you know, not only having the right people, but making sure they're doing the right things and you've, you've backed it up. So, mm. I, I, I don't want to say the industrialization because, 
you know. Or then again, you know, sometimes oh. people get funny about um, clients and 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 people, you know, clients going to advisors who've got a really industrial process. But maybe if you ever ask the clients, I think the outcome's pretty good, you know, provided they've got their tailored approach. So yeah. what what I would like to do is maybe just to get Bree's um, sort of take on that. And before I do that, Sue, I, I think from memory that popped up in your recent um, uh, uh, report. Would that be yeah. – that, that was one of the themes. Is that right? It absolutely was. It's one of the key ingredients in that uh, secret sauce for a great back office. Um, and we were talking about this recently because we um, – thankfully, I should shout out actually to the lovely peeps at uh, CFS because they sponsored this research. So Lana and I were talking about this on a, on a recent webinar with them. Like we know as coaches, we've seen it time and again, you know, businesses that have good processes, they deliver better outcomes, they, you know, they achieve more. Uh, we now have definitive proof. So we looked at those in the research that had documented processes uh, that people followed versus those that had not. And oh my God, there's still, there's only a third in this particular cohort. And, and unfortunately, it's quite consistent across lots of uh, small businesses that have documented robust processes that everybody followed. There were about another third that had some documented, but they weren't really robust. Um, but the bottom line was there was a difference of almost five and a half percent EBIT between those who had no processes versus those that had good processes and their satisfaction levels with uh, how happy they were with the success they were achieving in the business. It was about 3.8 out of five on average for those with good process and 3.44 out of five for those with none. It really does have an impact to the business overall. Well, let's throw to one of our um, – which which one of our practices do you think has, has a quote that's uh, that sort of nails down the benefit of having those processes done? Well, you know what? I think Bree captured that really well. Why don't we throw to Bree? So I, I think um, we've been pretty successful uh, probably in the last couple of years where we've purchased a number of client bases to to help uh, fill up advisor capacity and, and provide clients for some of our newer advisors. Um, and the way the business is structured is, as I mentioned before, we can replicate the pods that we have. We've got the systems and processes in place. So um, for us, organic growth would be great, um, but also very open to you know, the opportunity to purchase client bases or, or smaller businesses. Like he said, you know, there's a lot of one and two man bands out there who are really great financial advisors, but don't have the the time or the energy to to run the business. And, and that's something that we can take off them. So, you know, having that opportunity to join an established business um, and be able to, to let go of the back office stuff and just focus on, on clients and, and where they add the most value um, is is something that we're very open to um, those opportunities as they come along. Look, I think you've you've definitely got to have a great structure and a great discipline. But the real intent behind that is you've got to have a good culture. Everyone has to be doing it. You know, you, you've got to have. Uh, you can't build this great machine if people aren't. And and I think uh, Michael and Belinda really sum up um, a, a good culture. What's your thoughts, um, Sue? Oh. Could not agree more. In fact, Roxy, as you saw, that was another part of the secret sauce. You've got the structured discipline of running a business, having someone management manage it. You've got uh, the robust processes so everybody knows what they're doing. But if you do not have a, con a conscious focus on culture, you can't get the best out of your team. And again, that impacts your bottom line. And finally on that, if you don't have a good culture, people aren't going to do that discretionary effort. To, to embed a process, and you've got no hope in building a global team. So why don't we hear from Michael right now and Belinda um, on how they've used their culture to drive their process. Awesome. So in terms of the culture, our deep values are a love of learning, a love of teaching, and a love of empowering the families that we look after. All right. In terms of the principles that underpin those values, integrity, excellence, enthusiasm, and a sense of fairness. So when I'm when we're looking for people to join our culture, we need people who deliver excellence, who are passionate about learning and teaching and empowering the families that we're looking after. They need to be enthusiastic about how they go about their day in looking after our families. They need to have a sense of fairness when they're dealing with um, either us, uh, other employees, um, or as they're dealing with, with clients. 
Yeah, I think um, we kind of see that in the way that the team interacts with with each other. Yep. We also kind of see it in the ways that they interact with our clients as well. So it's that with clients, it's always that level of care, the the um, the want to deliver the best service, the mo- an excellent level of customer service, and a great experience. And I guess when it's it's the the within the team, it's that. Mutual respect for each other. Everybody comes in with different backgrounds, with different experience. And, you know, the senior advisors, they can always learn something from the CSO um, and vice versa. So everybody can learn off each other as well. So we do do a lot of training, kind of ad hoc training and things like that. Yeah, wasn't that a great, wasn't that a great sniffer? It's, it's, it is awesome processes, structured, great people. And the other thing that we saw consistent across these businesses, uh, was they all building a global team. And, and again, that came through in our research as well, because we had a good look at, at outsourcing. Um, and we know that people can do, outsourcing in a variety of ways you know I, I guess for these guys they all I think some of them outsource by task like they might have power planning done and pay per SOA but they all have employed offshore team members uh, and you know it, this is a real particularly in today's environment for growing businesses that are wanting to increase the quality of service to their clients increase their bottom line uh, it's really hard to find good quality talent here in Australia, right? And I'm, I still want to know, Roxy. We've lost all of these advisors. There's thousands of them that aren't in the profession anymore. What has happened to all of their great admin people that used to work with them? Because they don't seem to be around. Yeah, well, I think the comment. Um, I think you can find really great people. You just can't keep them if they've got shitty jobs. So oh, there you go. Yeah. Um, so yeah. you know, and what, what. And 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 that's probably a bit of a a bad comment because you know there's going to be a lot of product providers on here going, hang on, we we no longer uh, put you on hold for 27 minutes. We've got down there 23. Well, that's part of the problem. <laughs> in case you're wondering, right? Yeah, so yeah, so yeah, you know, being is, on hold yeah. to a a company that you then invest money and they make money from you, and thinking that that's a a cool way to 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 coexist uh, is. You know what's that? Is it Stockholm syndrome that we've got? I'm not sure, but, um, <laughs> but let's 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 listen to um, uh, the Blueprint team. They've they've been doing this for many years, and listen to yeah. sort of how they've integrated their global team. Um, and you're right. I'm not a big proponent of one size fits all. It's good to have a mosaic yeah. of options, both Australian and uh-huh. overseas. Um, and the bottom line is that that that. You are liberating your Australian team members to allow them to achieve their career ambitions um, if you can take yeah. away some of those tasks. So let's listen to um, Bree straight after I ask you one quick question, um, which is because uh, you just put your hand up when we're doing a video, right? So everyone, so I was just about to throw to a quote and uh, <laughs> Sue's put her hand up and I, and I was thinking, how can I possibly with tact to do a segue and I just give it up? So, Kieran, I don't know what oh, I don't know if you're going to just edit this smooth. out or move on, but uh, so you put your hand up, smooth, yeah. Roxy, yeah, smooth. Yeah, yeah, you put your hand up, <laughs> yeah, no, the, the young girl in the back of the say. class who keeps putting her hand up. What would you like? <laughs> She's so annoying. Uh, no, I wanted to say that you know sometimes people look at this at, as the sense of oh, let's just get the the crappy task that no one wants to do in Australia and give it to somebody uh, as a as a cheap resource. And I actually want to challenge that thinking because. It's not actually just about cheap labor. The the quality of people that you can get in a global team by a great provider is outstanding. Um, I think the the really crappy task is you want to use technology for just just you know, when you're optimizing your processes, stop anybody from doing them. Um, there are those tasks that do need to be done, like the sitting on hold, uh, but they can certainly be done by somebody at a lower price point. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're uh, they're not good quality people. Uh, but I think if you look at this through the lens of saying, how do I get everybody in the business doing their highest and best work? When you've got great team members in Australia who can liaise with clients uh, and and do some of the more involved tasks, just like one of the girls we were, hearing about, we were hearing about before, Crystal, she was a qualified advisor, but she chose not to go there. She wanted to do more deep, deep strategy work. Then you can backfill those team members with admin admin team members that are still great at doing those those um, attention to detail roles. Now, Roxy, I mean, you've, you've been doing this longer than I have, right? But am I right in saying 
So those businesses who've tried this and it didn't work, because I've heard from a lot of them, right, is that because they're just trying to throw the really worst jobs to these people and they don't manage them well? Or is it because they've got like, you know, a provider that doesn't have the right infrastructure to support these people? Like what? A bit of both. A bit of both. I mean, I'm, I'm, for people who've yeah. listened to me before, I, I was a, a, a client. I started doing um, offshore outsourcing in about 2004 um, with uh, on a pay per thing for accounting and for for uh, uh, lending and and then power planning. And um, I, I really think it just comes down to that that it comes down to the the, the C suite. You know, it comes down to the executive management. You've you've got to you can't just. This is not meant to be a a reaction to we're overworked in this particular division or we can't get our advice documents out or we've just acquired something. You need to have this embedded in your overall strategy. You know, it needs to be something that mm. that, that is a project because ultimately, you know, if, 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 if you're, let's say, for instance, you buy a business and you want to make $300,000 profit, well, if you can get this right and you can save $300,000, well, there's $300,000 profit. And three hundred, there's six hundred thousand dollars profit now. You spend a lot of time and effort on doing the first one, but but you need to have that executive attention on the second one. So let's let's throw to a couple of our clients who I think have nailed it. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm 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 still a client of this particular goods and service, um, and it just buys time. I mean, I can then, you know, um, ask questions to the girl at the back who puts her hand up all the time. So um, so let's throw to <laughs> Kieran if we could throw to Bree. And then maybe just st- straight into, um, uh, I think Jackie's got a good one as well. We'll do both of them back to back. I've got a question just to, I'm looking for you to maybe impart some knowledge or some magic dust um, on, on some of the listeners. So um, you mentioned that you have 15 people um, working with you um, offshore. So 15 people working for, with VBP, which is quite a large number. And practices yeah. um, with, with 28 people in Australia to have 15 people there um, you've obviously done something right. What what do you think uh, sort of two or three sort of people management things that Blueprint does that makes that work where others haven't been able to pull it off? Uh, look, I, th- I think we haven't always got it right, but we've learned from our mistakes. And I think what's really important to us is treating the offshore team like they're part of our team. So Anything our team does here, the offshore team does the same. So we've organised a Christmas party for our team. Uh, they get Christmas presents like the rest of the team. Um, you know, we attend the conferences over there so we can get to know them. Um, we've got five team members coming over to Perth to see us next year. Oh, wow. Um, yep. They have bonus plans in place. So um, we, we, we don't want them just to feel like a, a VBP employee. They're, they're part of the Blueprint team as well. So... Um, I think just understanding that they are part of the team and treating them that way um, gets a lot of loyalty um, and and communication is really key. I think working with an offshore team, you know, there can be a, a big cultural difference and the way we work can be very different to how people in the Philippines work and, and that's nothing wrong with that. That's just the difference in cultures. But having an understanding of that and trying to build those relationships so people are more comfortable, so you can have a two-way communication, so it's not just instruction giving and instruction taking. It's a it's a working relationship where you know they are the expert at what they do, so they need to tell us and be able to give us feedback so we can um, support them as we do our our team members here is is something that's important to us and. Similarly, with their career progression, it's understanding what they want to do. And as our team gets bigger, it's easier to do that because there's more opportunities to provide them different challenges within our um, team over there instead of them needing to look elsewhere within the VBP team. So they're probably the the three key things for us working with an offshore team. Yep. So, yep, we have pods. So usually headed by an, an advisor and uh, then supported by the service associates. Uh, pleased to say we have we use VBP. Uh, so associate Chan, who's in the Philippines, and uh, we also use a bound power planning. And uh, DJ is actually based in Serbia, which actually works quite well. His day begins as ours ends, but as long as we've briefed him and had that chat, he can work all night. So really from a client perspective, it actually means that we can work twice as fast because you're working around the clock as a team. 
these people particularly with the vbp team we've made sure that we've included them as part of our team so shan always attends the daily huddles Uh, we've just got team polos so shan's got a team polo she's on our website she's got a bio Uh, so very much she attends our weekly team meetings and uh, i think that's helped rather than picture them as something external she's very much a part of the team just happens to be in the philippines And unlike Serbia, the Philippines are basically on our same time zone. So I think from a service associate point of view, that's really good because they're dealing with lots of little things every day, whereas power planning can tend to be a a big project. So we find that that works being on a different time zone. For a lot of people who've been listening to, uh, first of all, the the three um, practices, the actual podcasts themselves, which if you haven't looped back... uh, they're available in all good, all good hearing stores. Um, the common theme might be, gee, these people have got it all together. Geez, they've kind of like, they, you might even say they've, they've kind of made it. But what I can tell you, interviewing these people, is that they're very much at the beginning of their journey. They're very much looking to the future. They're seeing their current state being the foundation to grow from. Is that something, that, is that a common sort of uh, theme when you're interviewing successful sort of practice in the way up, Sue? Absolutely. And it's funny, actually, because I was, I was just on a panel with a, an advisor yesterday and when we were prepping for it, talking about what we were going to say, they'd been invited on because they're a great business and they're doing some great things. And he was so self-deprecating. So, but we haven't done this and we haven't done this. And I'm like, no, 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 stop. Everybody in their business has got things that they're not they're not quite there yet. And that's quite normal like even with these three businesses they're quite large but as they go to another growth stage as they fix one thing it means that what they were doing in another area doesn't work anymore Uh, so I think that's really healthy you know it doesn't matter what where you're at in your business journey uh, if you do have this conscious thought of what can we do better how am I going to improve what we're doing Uh, what's the next level what am I trying to build here you know, it's easy to look at others and think that they're they're already nailing it and they've done what needs to be done, but it's never really done. It's there's always something else to improve, and that's healthy to have that that culture and that thought process. I think constant improvement. And with that, Sue, I'd like to uh, thank yourself and um, for not only today, but but also you know digging deep and and, and working out the business of the business. Now here at Ensemble, um, we're, we're we're really trying to to encourage the best environment for people to apply their craft because ultimately the, the consumers and the clients will win. Um, so thank you very much for uh, spending some of your time with me yet again. And My for pleasure. Every- no, that, perfect. And for everyone else, um, I hope you enjoyed our Engine Room Unpacked for another week. Have a great day. Cheers, everyone.